Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to invite you to Washington University Department of Medicine Grand Rounds, where we have an outstanding group of speakers this morning. First off, we have a panel, um, and the first speaker will be Dr. Mike Diamond, who's the Herbert Gasser Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease. He's also the Associate Director of the Center for Human Immunology and Immunotherapy Programs. He is a internationally recognized expert in virology and immunology um, who went to Columbia University for college, then went to Harvard for his MD, PhD, went to UCSF for his fellowship. And then we were fortunate to recruit him back to Washington University to the Infectious Disease Division in 2001. Mike has been incredibly productive, incredibly well-funded studying um, flaviviruses, starting with dengue, chikungunya, Zika, um, and every emerging virus, and now is um, being extraordinarily productive with rapid research on COVID-19. He'll talk about the basic virology of the virus, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then next we have Dr. Rachel Presti, MD, PhD, who's Associate Professor of Medicine in the Infectious Disease Division who went to Scripps for undergraduate and then did her MD, PhD here at Washington University School of Medicine and in Infectious Disease Fellowship and has been on the faculty since. She did her uh, fellowship and research training in the laboratory of Dr. Herbert Virgin here in pathology and immunology and has a very strong background in basic science, virology, immunology, and then has been an extraordinary leader in translational research and is the medical director of the Clinical Research Unit in Infectious Disease and the site director for the ACTU here and currently is coordinating efforts to um, lead clinical and translational research for COVID here on the campus. Our third speaker is Dr. Patrick Aguilar of the Pulmonary Critical Care Division in the Department of Medicine, who's currently assistant professor of medicine who did his training uh, under undergraduate training at University of Texas in the Parmian Basin, then went to medical school, UT Medical Branch in Galveston, did his residency at UT San Antonio, and we were very fortunate to recruit him here for his pulmonary critical care fellowship at Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, then he went back to Texas for a year, and we were fortunate to recruit him back here to Washington University as the medical director for our um, medical ICU. He's also been incredibly active uh, recently, also in leading ECMO programs, and he's the uh, chairman of the Critical Care Committee for Washington University School of Medicine and Barnes Jewish Hospital. And he's been in the command center, I think pretty much 24 seven for about two months, helping to coordinate the critical care and medical aspects. So, um, out there, if you can, please join me in welcoming these three outstanding speakers. Um, Mike Diamond is at home doing excellent social distancing, and then we have four people in this auditorium, which is built for 300, so we're also doing uh, strong social distancing. Just um, a little bit of situational awareness for us off the EPIC dashboard this morning. Um, I have 32 patients admitted to Barnes Jewish Hospital with COVID-19, 36 people under investigation. Um, and in the ICU, 20 plus 33 people under investigation and 25 people on ventilators. In the state of Missouri, there are 1671 cases with 22 deaths. St. Louis County has 605 cases with four deaths. St. Louis City has 239 cases with one death. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started with Dr. Diamond. I'm going to be the Vanna White for uh, Dr. Diamond advancing his slides. So um, Mike, why don't you go ahead and get started and just tell me when you want your next slide. Great. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Um, my goal here is to introduce some of you to the basic virology, both at the level of the coronavirus, as well as really trying to understand some of the goals of the research portfolio at Washington University in the basic sciences department. So the next slide. 
this is my disclosures. I have some consulting uh, and some scientific advisory boards and some stock equity. Um, next slide. So I'm not going to go greatly into the ep epidemiology. I think probably the other speakers will. Needless to say, uh, COVID-19 disease and SARS-CoV-2 started in China and has spread globally as part of uh, epidemics and pandemics across the world and clearly is a major problem now and will be a major problem for the next several months, if not longer, until such time that there are significant interventions or it wanes uh, due to herd immunity. Next slide. So in the United States, this is already obviously out of date, just when I posted it a few days ago, we are now well over 100,000 uh, cases uh, with the epicenter in New York City, as well as in other parts of New York and New Jersey, in hot spots in California, Illinois. And here, as we know, there's surging cases in St. Louis, mostly in, uh, in, the, uh, in the inner city regions. Uh, also in other parts. And what has come out of some of the epidemiology, in addition to the fact that there's transmission probably from asymptomatic individuals, is that this is hitting very hard in the uh, uh, socioeconomically poor individuals, as well as clinically more devastating in the elderly, as well as the immunocompromised. Next, Next. slide. And so, as you, most of you are quite aware, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus, and then the disease is COVID-19, and the common symptoms are fever, dry cough, and fatigue. However, there are a number of other symptoms that are associated with this disease, which uh, uh, occur slightly less frequently, uh, including uh, GI symptoms, including with people actually presenting with uh, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. There's been uh, uh, cases now where there's loss of taste and loss of sense of smell associated with it. And uh, part of this has to do with the unique tropism for this virus, which I'll talk about in a little bit, where it engages its receptor and how that influences the types of cells that get infected, what happens afterwards, including cytolytic death associated by, with the virus, and then the immune response itself, which can be patholo which is believed to be pathologic, and the combination of a virus which is killing cells and potentially immune cell response, which can be lead to injury, is what causes some of the devastating disease that we see. And as you heard, leads to people getting uh, uh, not only pulmonary infection, but then requiring significant uh, uh, interventions, including ventilator support. Next slide. The coronavirus is a very interesting virus from the standpoint of an RNA virus. And one of the reasons why is it is the largest single-stranded positive polarity RNA virus that there is. And it's probably, uh, there are different um, uh, species of coronaviruses. Uh, usually there's somewhere between 25 and 30, actually probably 26 and 31 KB. In comparison, one thinks about picornaviruses being in the range of four to five KB, flaviviruses 11 KB. These things are just massive. Uh, this is not to scale, but there are really, uh, here the beta coronaviruses is the group of coronaviruses that includes SARS, SARS-CoV-2 and MERS and some other uh, human ones, I'll come back to this in a minute, but you can see here that it is, has a very complex genetic uh, makeup. There's two open reading frames, or 1A and 1B, which are shifted by a ribosomal frame shift, and these encode the majority of the uh, uh, viral enzymes, uh, including the polymerase, uh, as well as proteases and uh, other enzymes. And these, in theory, could be targeted for, uh, for drug development, although uh, 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 there's, there would be a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, remdesivir is one of those drugs, which Rachel's probably going to talk about, which uh, is uh, targeting the polymerase, which is in these open reading frames. In addition to the, uh, the ORFs that encode the viral enzymes, there are also a suite of um, proteins in other open reading frames. You can see these numbers like 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, which encode um, molecules that we don't fully understand in coronaviruses. Many of them are thought to be immune evasion, meaning ones that are either intrinsically inhibiting cellular innate immune responses within the cell or maybe secreted and antagonizing the uh, innate and adaptive immunity outside of the cell. And so there's really a, a lot of fundamental biology that needs to be understood for each particular coronavirus. We have learned a lot about SARS-CoV over the years, but the functions of these proteins may differ between um, individual ones. Next, Next slide. So if we look at the important pathogenic coronaviruses in the species, uh, and, and their species targets, you can see that they cause a range of diseases, but the respiratory tract is one that is actually quite common if you look on the right side of the symptoms and also the GI tract. And this is true for human viruses as well as for cat viruses, the feline infectious peritonitis virus is a, a, a significant one. There's bovine viruses, there's a whale virus. Uh, what I think it, I'd like to point out is the human ones that you know about. There's the human 229E, which is a 
one that is uh, commonly caused uh, of, of common cold or mild upper respiratory symptoms, as well as NL63. And these may even be co-circulating at the same time that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is circulating. And so people may present with very mild symptoms and have another coronavirus, which does not uh, progress to severe disease. As you can see, SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, those are the ones that have significant mortality rates. And obviously this slide predates um, uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of the information about SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Next slide. Just um, to give you an idea of what is the viral particle sort of looking like, and I, I, on my first slide, there was a, a cryo-EM structure of it and then also a reconstruction. You have the spike protein on the outside, which gives it its, uh, its name, corona, meaning sort of a crown of spikes, if you will. And then within inside, you have an envelope virus, so the, the virus has an envelope in it, which uh, impacts our ability to, um, uh, uh, to decontaminate it with either alcohols or bleach or other things. And also its transmissibility in the GI tract is affected by bile acids. So you have an envelope virus and inside you have the RNA um, and also nuclear proteins. And you have um, a series of proteins that then either are functioning in virus receptor binding, uh, replication, and also immune evasion. Next slide. And so if you look at where did this virus actually come from, if you do a dendrogram, you can see pretty clearly on the bottom is the original human SARS viruses. Those are three different isolates on the bottom in red. And the, the closest one there is to one of the civet viruses, but also to some bat-related viruses. And so it's felt that it, SARS emerged in a bat population and a civet population and then jumped into the human population in 2003. Obviously, we had a number of cases and then they waned and it disappeared and never came back for uncertain reasons. However, now if we look at up top where we see in the yellow, the SARS-CoV-2, you can see that there's, that's the Wuhan isolate, which is uh, one, one of the original isolates that was identified. And it is very close to this bat virus called RATG13. So it is felt that it likely jumped from a bat, although there are other theories about a, a, a intermediate pangolin and otherwise. And so there is still some debate, but it is likely that there was a, a very close bat variant that then jumped into the, there was a recombination event that allowed this thing to change slightly and then jump into the uh, human population and propagate. Next slide. And so this is just a sequence comparison of SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV, so the original SARS and the new SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, SARS COVID-19. And you can see on the right side is the percent identity of the amino acids. And on the top are the non-structural proteins that are associated with uh, many of the enzymatic functions like the replicate, the, the polymerase and otherwise. And these are highly conserved in the 80s to 90s, 90, 90 percentile. And so uh, it, the theory there is that drugs that might target these uh, non-structural proteins would have a reasonable chance of actually working against multiple uh, beta coronaviruses in the family. And then as you go down, you can see the bottom red line is the spike protein. And you can see here, there's a lot less conservation. It's only about 76% identity at the amino acid level. So there's been some variation and, uh, uh, in it. And this also has impacts for cross-reactive antibodies that people might have generated against SARS and whether they would protect or not. And also there were uh, therapeutics that were generated, antibody therapeutics in particular, and whether they might have activity. And I'll come back to this in a little bit. Next slide. Here is a model for coronavirus uh, entry and replication. So there's an attachment to a receptor. The receptor turns out to be, the dominant receptor turns out to be human ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme. Uh, the virus then gets into the cell, into the cytoplasm via endocytosis, and then escape from the uh, endosome through, through pH triggered uh, proteolytic events that occur. It then gets into the cytoplasm, starts to replicate. And unlike, let's say, flu and, uh, and HIV, the virus uh, actually assembles in the endoplasmic reticulum, much like a flavivirus does, and then is released as a whole particle as opposed to budding from the cell surface. That said, there still are spike proteins that can be detectable on the cell surface. And that's important because then those spike proteins on an infected cell, in theory, could be targeted by antibodies for antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity or phagocytosis, in addition to antibody effects on the viral particle itself. Next slide. So these are the two uh, mechanisms of entry that are proposed for coronaviruses and probably are true for SARS-CoV-2, although it's not formally been shown. One is, is that there's this ACE2 on the surface. You can see on the left side, it engages the virus through the spike protein. And I'll show some of the data for that in a few minutes. 
and then it gets in through endo endocytosis. There's a, a there's a cleavage event that then allows um, it to be sensitized to pH, and then you get fusion and release. And this is where the idea that chloroquine may uh, block infection. So chloroquine is one of the proposed therapies. Rachel will probably talk about it. And chloroquine blocks the acidification of the endosome. And so therefore the virus would get stuck in the endosome and it would be uh, then targeted to the lysosome eventually and then destroyed. However, there's a bypass pathway, which is thought to be at the cell surface through another protein called Tempris 2, which leads to cleavage in the spike. And this is thought to be able to lead to direct plasma membrane fusion. And so if this occurs, you might bypass the endosomal pathway and bypass the chloroquine sensitive pathway and still get infection. This work um, still needs to be documented for SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. So the original data suggesting that ACE2 was a receptor, uh, there's, there's been a phenomenal amount of work in a very short time by a number of groups internationally across multiple continents. And I'm not only gonna just give you a little smattering of the data here, this is uh, surface plasma residence tracings to show as you increase the concentration of human ACE2, you get binding signal on the left side, you can see the signal increases. If you look on the bottom right, you can see the alignment of the SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV in the region of the binding site for ACE2. And red is homology, and you can see there's quite a lot of homology in the receptor binding domain for these, although there are some variations. And so ACE2 was shown to be a receptor for both SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. And just a couple of pieces of the data here, people use uh, either a fully infectious virus to document this. On the right, you can see if you express human ACE2, the light blue, graphs, you can get much more, much higher levels of infection compared to without human ACE2 on a cell. And then people use pseudoviruses, which can be used at lower in, uh, biosafety containment, BSL-2, and you can then express cells with different ACE2s, a bad ACE2, a human ACE2, or some other receptors. And you can see on the left side that the SARS-CoV-2 uses the, both the human and the bad okay, ACE2. Dad, could you try again? Oh, um, next slide. So there's been uh, 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 cryo-EM reconstructions uh, uh, of, of these molecules. This is one that was done um, just a few weeks ago. And this is the spike protein from the virus. Just looking at it on the left side, you're looking at it uh, on a, in, the, in the side section. So you can see on the viral membrane and on the top is the green region, which is the receptor binding domain. So you can see it's right on the top. You, you form a trimer of proteins. And then this receptor binding domain is then able to directly engage ACE2, which would be out coming in from the top. And you can look at this also if you are from the top view, uh, which is rotated 90 degrees on the right side, and you can see full exposure of that receptor binding domain on the trimeric spike. Next slide. What is interesting is that if you now take alignment of SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, remember I told you that the spike proteins were about 76% identical, and you look at the different regions of the spike domains, so there's an N-terminal domain, there's the S2 domain, there's S1, and then you look at the RBD. The RBD is the most interesting here. Green is the uh, SARS-CoV-2, white is SARS-CoV, and you can see actually there's some significant variation between SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 with it in terms of the angle of display of some of the loops, as well as um, uh, some of the uh, beta sheets as well. And so there's actual significant differences with this. And this suggests that only a subset of antibodies which recognize SARS-CoV-2 in the receptor binding domain likely will bind to SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS that are shared from SARS-CoV. Next slide. So um, uh, cleavage events are actually important and we're beginning to understand this. So uh, the, the SARS-CoV has to be activated by proteolytic events in order for it to be able to engage its receptors. There turns out to be a proteolytic event on the inside of the cell on the way out. Remember the, the viral particle forms in the endoplasmic reticulum and on the way out, it goes through a furin mediated cleavage in the late Golgi, which leads to one type of cleavage for the spike protein. And then this Tempris 2 protein, which is on the surface of the cell leads to a second cleavage cleavage. And if you get both cleavage events, you probably go in through one route. If you get one cleavage event, you may get go through another route. If you don't get cleavage events, you may have a non-infectious particle. And this may differ in different cell types, and this may influence the tropism of the virus, as well as its ability to be recognized by antibodies, as well as its relative infectivity. So this complex series of cleavage events that occur to the spike protein will influence uh, both antibody recognition and probably receptor engagement. Next slide. 
And so to summarize um, uh, some of our basic findings, if we compare SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, they look quite similar as coronaviruses. They have very, very similar genetic orientation. We still have probably have some uh, 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 more understanding to understand how these accessory ORF proteins are working and how they may vary between the two of them. They both use the same receptor, ACE2, and they both have cleavage events by this Tempris 2 protein. Uh, so uh, that's one of the reasons why they both seem to affect uh, 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 cells in the pulmonary uh, tree distribution and also cause infection. However, the variation in the open, other open reading frames may influence the immune responses and may give us different diseases. We do know that in COVID-19, we're seeing many clinical manifestations that we didn't really see so much in SARS-CoV, including the GI manifestations. And we really don't understand what's going on in the heart. As many of you are aware, there seems to be a high frequency of conduction defects as well as just uh, uh, frank uh, transition to asystole and death. And really that's not understood at all. And whether there's direct infection uh, uh, associated with myocarditis or whether there is some indirect uh, um, inflammatory mediator, mediated injury remains to be uh, understood. Next slide. And so just basically, uh, it just shortly, I'm gonna give you a very, very brief synopsis of what's going on here. Uh, much of the work is focused on diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccine, and understanding host targets. Next slide. And so uh, in summary, uh, and this number is increasing, this was as of uh, a few days ago, I think the number has actually increased. There were 25 investigators that were actively working on, uh, uh, on SARS-CoV-2 at WashU in the School of Medicine. Um, I think this number has now increased. They span many different departments, including medicine, micro, path, PEDS, radiation onc, genetics, emergency medicine. Many of them are focused on countermeasures one way or the other, either developing them or testing them looking at diagnostics, either new RNA-based tests or serology-based tests, which could tell us people, whether people have been previously exposed, even if they were asymptomatic. Obviously, if we had a good test for that, then people could rejoin the workforce and not be uh, at a, a risk for transmitting virus or getting the virus themselves. And obviously, the work has been basic, clinical, translational, and hopefully transformative. Next slide. And just to give you an idea of the number of the basic investigators, uh, this is just a, a subset of them working on uh, uh, either drug testing, vaccine development, mouse models, uh, uh, therapies, uh, entry factor biology, genetic screens, cell death pathways, infection in the pulmonary tree, infection in the GI, in the GI tract. There's just large numbers of work that's ongoing here uh, at WashU uh, and hopefully will uh, contribute significantly to our understanding of uh, this particular virus. Next slide. And just to give you an, one example, um, there's been a big interest in neutralizing antibodies, both at the level of monoclonal antibodies and immune plasma. And my lab, along with uh, David Fremont, Ali Alabetti, and Sean Whalen in the basic region have been un interested in understanding monoclonal antibody targeting. And Jeff Henderson in, in ID and, and also Rachel Presti and, his gr and their groups have been interested in immune plasma as it relates to being able to treat patients directly um, with uh, uh, people who are in either in the intensive care unit or hopefully don't get to the intensive care unit. Next slide. And just as an aside, we've been able to identify uh, assays that now we can screen antibodies here. These are uh, focused reduction assays as an example. And you can see on the right side, we can identify monoclonal antibodies that completely inhibit viral infection at high potency. And so these antibodies are, are being studied now for potential um, development as therapeutics. Next slide. And um, so if we summarize the work that's going on at WashU and the link to translation, there are countermeasures as vaccines, antibodies, and drugs, diagnostics, and then a host of work in basic biology. And I think the next slide is my last slide, just like to acknowledge the people in my lab who are doing all of the work on COVID-19. There are a number of collaborators that we have at WashU. And then um, I'll stop and answer questions at the end. Thanks, Mike. And so now we'll turn it over to Dr. Rachel Presti. Hi, um, this is not what I thought I'd be giving grand rounds on. So, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what is going on in terms of clinical um, and some translational research. I don't have any disclosures. Um, so um, just really to start, I'm going to give you an outline, but, um, but I also want to just give you a couple caveats. First of all, SARS-CoV-2 has um, only been really known and around for the last three months, which is not a lot of time for developing um, clinical research um, on it and developing therapeutics. Um, there, um, there has been in our region a delay in the number of cases. And because of that, a lot of the clinical trials that have been enrolled and have been enrolling um, selected sites where there were considerably more cases. So we have 
less of the national clinical trials at Washington University um, in part because of that. Um, however, because there has been a delay, down, okay, sorry, I'm short. Um, because there's been a delay um, in cases coming here, we actually do have some idea um, about what we can do and what might work and what might not work um, and had some time to prepare um, some clinical um, trials, clinical research um, to try to understand um, what works best and to try to provide um, potential therapies for our patients. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we are supporting translational research, the kind of research that um, Mike Diamond was talking about. Um, and then I'm going to give an overview of a select number of drugs of interest um, that, um, that we are hoping to uh, work with. Um, and then uh, a little bit on two clinical trials that are already um, ready um, or near ready to go. Um, and then a, a little bit on some um, potential interventions um, that should lead hopefully into a, a what um, Dr. Aguilar talked about. So one of the most important things actually was, is to support the translational research so that we can help develop diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines in the future. Um, there is a good coordination at the university um, with um, I2, with the ICTS, with the CCS, and a variety of other um, pretty much across, uh, across the university to coordinate both data collection and to um, develop a clinical specimen protocol. So this was really um, work that was initiated by Dr. Philip Mudd in emergency medicine and uh, Jane O'Halloran in infectious disease. Um, and they developed this protocol that's been enrolling already for a week to collect blood, urine, saliva, um, remnant clinical samples. Um, when available, we'll collect swabs um, and sputum. Um, those patients who are being tested for COVID-19 in the emergency department um, were consented and their samples were collected. If they are hospitalized, then samples are collected while in the hospital. Um, and then convalescent samples will be collected as an outpatient. Um, so the picture show there is Phil Mudd and um, Ali Alabidi and his group um, processing those samples. Um, because this is expected to become a large endeavor, we now have um, in, uh, resources from um, the um, Tissue Procurement Lab and Mark Watson um, to um, store all of these samples, to biobank them, and really to use this as a university-wide um, source of specimens um, for research. Um, the contact person, if you are interested in using specimens, um, is Chris Grinnett at the ICTS. Um, she is coordinating um, the utilization of those specimens and, and um, getting them to the right people. So that's what we're doing to try to support translational research. I'm going to talk a little bit about potential drugs and what we are interested in looking at. One of the first ones is one of the oldest ones, chloroquine. Um, it's a potent inhibitor of uh, viral growth in vitro, and that is shown um, in the graph below with a fairly low EC50 of 1.13. Um, it increases endosomal pH, something that Mike Diamond talked about. Um, it also has some immune modulatory effects, um, which may have downstream effects as well. Um, it is widely distributed, um, including um, high distribution in the lung, which is where you would want it to be. Um, the recommended doses that people have been using of chloroquine for, um, for COVID-19 have been wildly variable. Um, we did pick a dose um, for our studies that is higher than the dose used for malaria, um, but hopefully not too high. Um, there is significant toxicity with chloroquine, um, most particularly cardiac and QTC prolongation, and so we want to watch that closely. Um, I think some of us in the clinical realm are concerned that um, some of the um, cardiac toxicity that has been described and sudden death that has been described um, in some of these COVID-19 cases could actually be toxicity that we are generating because not just chloroquine, but Kaletra and um, azithromycin and numerous other drugs that have been used in this setting um, all have QTC prolongation. Um, chloroquine also can cause a retinopathy that's usually with um, longer term dose. It also has a fairly high potential for overdose, particularly in um, the pediatric population. Um, and so you do need to be careful about making sure we're not giving too much. One of the drugs that's very similar, and you can see the structural similarity um, to chloroquine, is hydroxychloroquine. Um, it is um, purported to have less toxicity, but does have somewhat of the same um, toxicities as chloroquine, including QTC prolongation. 
Um, there are um, actually a couple of published studies now. Um, one of the first ones that came out was a French one um, that maybe, um, and you can see in the graph there, the green line is the viral clearance with um, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin um, compared to hydroxychloroquine alone or no, no um, drug. Um, it's important to note that that trial was not randomized um, and there are no clinical outcomes that were reported with that. Um, in a second study, a Chinese study, a 30 patient study that was randomized, they did not show a benefit on clinical outcome, but the cases in that study were very, very very mild and most people resolve their fever within a day anyways. Um, so it's hard to, to demonstrate an improvement on um, resolution of symptoms and fever within three or four days. Um, the second drug is not one that we are um, anticipating using, uh, lopinavir ritonavir, um, also known as Kaletra. Um, it is an HIV protease inhibitor and there was some data in vitro and in animal models showing some activity against MERS and so it was thought that it might be helpful against SARS-CoV-2. However, fairly early on, uh, a pretty good randomized open-label trial of um, almost 200 people came out um, and showed that there was really no time, uh, no difference in time to clinical improvement, no difference in virologic suppression um, using lopinavir ritonavir versus um, control. Um, and so, uh, again, this drug is not particularly well tolerated in the HIV population, causes a lot of diarrhea. Um, it also probably doesn't get to great levels um, pharmacokinetically, um, and so it would be difficult to get it to levels where you would expect virologic suppression. Um, there was potentially a difference in mortality, but that was not significantly different. Um, I think there are still people who are looking into it. Um, this also does cause QT prolongation. So um, since the data for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine appears to be somewhat better, um, that's the drug that um, people are using. Um, there is another drug that has been used in Japan and China called favipiravir. Um, it inhibits the viral polymerase. It is approved in Japan for influenza. Um, it is not as potent in vivo, in vitro, as um, chloroquine or some of the other drugs. Um, there is our sort of reports, although these haven't been reviewed and published yet, um, that there may have been an early infection of fast real time to viral clearance um, in patients given favipiravir um, plus inhaled interferon um, compared versus lopinavir ritonavir and um, inhaled uh, interferon um, and maybe some improvement in chest imaging. Um, so the issue with favipiravir though is, is it is not FDA approved um, for use in the US. Um, there are negotiations ongoing um, with the company in Japan um, with the FDA to see if it may be used in clinical trials here. Um, the drug that most people are talking about is remdesivir, and we actually have no clinical data yet on this. Um, it was uh, developed as a fairly broad, broad antiviral. Um, it's a, an adenosine analog, so again, it inhibits the RNA polymerase. Um, it does have activity against a wide range of viruses in vitro and in non-human primate models. Um, was actually developed for Ebola, um, treatment and did not do particularly well in um, those studies. It has a similar EC50 in vitro to chloroquine with an EC50 of 0.77. Um, there are um, a considerable number of trials that are underway and results are actually expected sometime in the next few weeks um, from some of those studies. Um, currently, uh, while the company did try to stockpile um, both remdesivir and um, the precursors to making remdesivir. Um, they um, are reporting that hundreds of thousands of people are asking them for uh, the use of this drug. Um, there is an expanded access program in development um, and we are currently working on being added um, as a site to that. So hopefully we will get word of that within the next week or so. Um, and then to go thoroughly old school, um, treatments that we have probably used for almost 100 years um, when it would be to use um, plasma from people who have recovered from the virus. Um, so, so one thing to keep in mind with this virus is while we are seeing the folks in the hospital who are critically ill um, and it is very difficult um, to figure out what to do and how to treat them, most of the people who get this infection get better. Um, Convalescent plasma has been used in a whole variety of epidemics in the past, including SARS um, and Ebola. Um, it's probably more effective 
early in disease or as prophylaxis than it is as treatment. Um, however, because there are not good treatments for, um, for folks who are critically ill, um, the FDA has issued some guidance on um, using this on an emergency IND um, perspective. Um, the blood, that guidance was issued last week. The blood banks found out about it after it was issued. Um, and so they are all um, in a hurry trying to identify these folks. Um, so plasma donors for convalescent plasma to be used in COVID-19 need to meet all the standard requirements for convalesce or for plasma donation. Um, and then they also need to have a negative NP swab or be at least 28 days post any symptoms of infection. Um, and then they want a measurement of the antibodies, um, although there's not a, a standardized um, measurement available. So, um, so um, those are the extra things that need to be acquired in order to refer someone to a blood bank um, to donate convalescent plasma. I will talk about that more in just a sec. Um, we do have a clinical trial that we are expecting to open um, in the next couple of days, hopefully. It's being reviewed um, by our um, human research committee um, today. Um, this is a forearm study comparing chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin. Those drugs were kindly donated by Express Scripts. Um, the dosing is shown there. There are four arms. People are randomized to a treatment arm, so there is no placebo in this study. There are a lot of ongoing, at least 25 clinical trials comparing hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine to placebo, um, and so this is really a treatment strategy protocol. The key inclusion-exclusion criteria, um, people must be hospitalized with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection and consented to the study. Um, because of the concern for QT prolongation, um, we have requirements on the QTC being less than 470 for men and less than 480 for women. Um, and we want people to have normal electrolytes before we put them on these drugs um, to avoid the problems with arrhythmias and QTC prolongation. Um, the exclusion criteria includes significant underlying cardiac disease um, that might um, predispose uh, to that, um, retinal eye disease, and G6PD deficiency because of the concern for hemolysis with chloroquine. Um, the second study that we are um, working on would be to use convalescent plasma. Currently, that can be used um, under an emergency IND, um, and we are working with local blood banks um, to identify potential donors um, and build up the supply. Um, I spoke about this before, but the donors must be negative um, by NP swab and be asymptomatic for 14 days. We are collecting blood both to measure antibodies and saving blood for future studies of um, convalescent immune response. Um, I, the uh, referral there um, is uh, idcrew at westall.edu um, if you have, uh, are aware of people who might be interested in this program. Um, in the future, we are also working on developing a randomized study for hospitalized patients um, that's pending an IND from FDA to compare convalescent plasma to, um, to standard plasma. I think Patrick will talk more about this, but there are also um, considerable evidence of immune um, uh, effects that may be pathogenic. Um, so there's evidence of cytokine storm in critically ill folks with high CRP, D-dimer, IL-6, and other inflammatory cytokines. Um, some of the data is very conflicting on this. And so some, um, some folks will have higher CRP and lower D-dimer or and um, so, so not all of these cytokines are moving um, together. Um, one of the most talked about um, potential interventions would be using one of the IL-6 receptor blockers, such as tocilizumab. Um, there are studies ongoing um, from China and Italy to see how this works. Um, there is, are studies um, being done in the US. Those sites have already been selected. Um, there is a bit of a shortage on tocilizumab. I, um, I think one of the things we need to keep in mind um, when we are considering immunomodulatory agents is that in the absence of a good antiviral, um, some of that immune response is probably fighting off viral infection and it is a cytolytic virus. So, um, so we do not want to completely disrupt the immune effects um, because some of those are probably helpful even if they are inflammatory. Um, currently, steroids are not recommended 
Um, there's some discussion about potentially using statins, which have shown potential benefit in clinical trials in ARDS in the past um, with an inflammatory subtype. Um, I think there are lots more immune modulatory um, trials that will be coming online um, and we'll keep you um, abreast of those in the future. The other thing is all of this is going on and everybody wants to help and that is fantastic and wonderful. Um, the, currently, the only known therapy that works for COVID-19 is supportive care. Currently, the only preventive therapy that we know works is standard infection prevention. So those are critical um, to, um, to maintain. Um, we need to know more about potential therapies in an environment that is changing very, very rapidly and our success is gonna require us to work together. Um, there has been a research governance board put together that consists of Bill Powderly, Sean Whalen, and Jeff Milbrandt. Um, those are being referred um, to the ICTS um, to propose. So if you have proposed clinical or translational research studies that you wanna do, um, please contact the ICTS. Um, uh, those studies are being reviewed very, very rapidly um, to, to try to get the best things out to our patients. Um, and again, um, refer us potential plasma donors, I'm happy to talk to them. So just a couple of acknowledgements. Um, this has really been spearheaded by um, Bill Powderly and Vicki Frazier, and we really appreciate their support. Um, Steve Miller at Express Scripts um, donated the drug for the um, study of um, the four arms with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Um, Jane O'Halloran and Phil Mudd um, were instrumental in getting the um, translational um, sample collection protocols up and running. Um, Jane, Charles Goss, and um, Andre Speck were instrumental in, in, um, in getting the forearm clinical trial up and running. Um, and then we've been working with Jeff Henderson and Brenda Grossman in transfusion medicine um, to uh, do the uh, donor plasma and um, convalescent plasma protocols. Um, and then a lot of help from um, both the ID crew and um, ICTS. Um, and I guess I'll take questions at the end. Dr. Patrick Aguilar. Good morning. Thanks, Steph, for the opportunity to talk. Uh, Rachel made the point a second ago that the only proven therapy for COVID-19 is supportive care and the only prevention uh, measure is general infection prevention. So that makes my talk incredibly easy. Uh, essentially, it's over. No, just kidding. I'll have more to say as I usually do. Uh, thanks, Adam, for inserting a disclosure slide, which I forgot to put, and it, it is true that I have no disclosures related to this. I'll talk briefly about the approach that I want to take the next few minutes and the approach is as follows. I want to walk through the thought process about how we uh, uh, handle consideration of patients in the period of time where, where we're facing a pandemic and then talk some about the on-the-ground realities of how to interface with patients with this problem and some of the unique aspects of care. Uh, and then at the end, I can take specific questions. Obviously, we won't be able to uh, cover all of the details and, and things change all the time. So, so to some extent, some of the things that you may be most curious about are things uh, about which I have insufficient data to put it on a slide in a grain rounds. But uh, at the end, when we ask questions, I'm happy to talk about whatever I can. The story begins uh, with testing. Who do you test and, and when do you suspect this? And I think that that's a really important set of questions that's covered a lot of how we've uh, uh, seen things evolve over the last couple weeks. At the beginning of the pandemic, at the beginning of our recognition of the pandemic, I should say, we had a serious limitation in terms of testing resources, and that limitation prompted us to behave differently than we behave now in terms of who we test and, and how we uh, consider when to do that. Uh, as that problem got relieved by the excellent work done in the lab by uh, Carrie and Burnham and Neil Anderson and their uh, fantastic teams, um, we have changed our stance and then more proactive in testing uh, to try to capture as many people as we can uh, and decide how to approach cohorting and how to approach uh, differential therapies and, and so on. Uh, the other factor that's changed that is the recognition that an increasing prevalence in the community means that um, we need to behave differently than we did at the beginning. So whereas initially there were strict rules around who we would test that related to epidemiologic links, those rules have changed as the virus is now common in the community and we recognize that we need to be a little bit more um, attuned to that. That recognition is paired with the ability to do so. And so you can see here on the slide the most recent, recent testing heuristic that's been released by uh, BJC and, and I think that it is probably the best uh, that we can do at the moment. Uh, for patients who are critically ill, which is patients uh, who require ventilatory support, 
uh, or people who have undifferentiated respiratory failure, we recommend consideration of testing and, and testing. Um, in, in terms of undifferentiated respiratory failure, that gets really tough. If you have somebody who has edema up to the mid-thigh, a blood pressure of 250 systolic, and pulmonary edema on a chest x-ray, that seems pretty classic for uh, not COVID. And so generally, we are not testing those patients. But obviously, as the frequency of disease in the community increases, it's going to be hard to uh, know that we're really not missing something there. We are in a better resource situation, but we're not resource unlimited. There are still swab limitations and reagent limitations that create uh, problems for us in terms of uh, testing as many people as we might like or retesting over and over in people that we are highly suspicious. Um, that's, that's worth noting and, and uh, we appreciate everyone's uh, diligent attention to, to trying to conserve those resources as, as well as the resources that we'll talk about throughout the talk. The other group of patients for whom that, yeah, you may think of this is people who have compatible symptoms and history. That includes uh, new or worsening cough. You can see that it's worsening is called out as a separate label because there are patients who cough all the time. People with asthma, people with ILD, uh, and so on. And, and uh, if they were to be asked on any given day, they probably have some suite of symptoms that might feel like COVID. And so that uh, introduces another diagnostic dilemma. Do you test everyone? who has any set of symptoms that may sound like COVID. And, and the answer to that is uh, we really have to rely on the clinical judgment of our colleagues. Uh, we have to rely on our own clinical judgment as well. And so uh, we work together with uh, other providers who've seen patients upstream in the system to try to do the best we can to figure out who to test and to do that in a rational way. Uh, our emergency department colleagues have an uh, unbelievable feat ahead of them and, and in front of them now, and they do excellent work. And uh, often we, later on see pieces of data that make us wonder why they made the decisions they made, but our best uh, help to them is to uh, not necessarily Monday morning quarterback, but recognize the immediate changes that can prompt different thought processes about how to test. So I've spent a long time talking about who to test and I've really told you essentially nothing uh, except that you should use your clinical judgment, which is really all we have. In terms of prioritization of how tests should be allocated, the CDC has released this prioritization scheme. Uh, at the top is people who are hospitalized, and we'll talk about why. Further down the line are people uh, such as ourselves who are healthcare workers, and then uh, on down to eventually people who don't have symptoms. Ultimately, you really don't want to test asymptomatic patients uh, for two reasons. One is, again, the resource limitation that I, I've already talked about, and the other is that it's not clear that you would really be doing anything other than giving your a false sense of security if you got back a negative swab. So uh, although there is a symptomatic transmission at some level, it's not clear uh, the degree of severity of that, and we're not recommending asymptomatic testing at this point, and that will continue, I, I suspect, to be our recommendation. One other thing I'll say about testing is that you, you will hear in the news about lots of fancy tests that come back in 30 seconds or 45 minutes or whatever. Some of those tests are great and are uh, ready for prime time. Our lab has machinery that can handle a lot of that, but as of yet, we have not been given the uh, reagents and the actual test kits to do that. We've ordered it and uh, Carrie Ann and her team are really working hard with the companies to try to make sure that we get that as, as fast as we can. But you might imagine there's a demand for that everywhere. The reason for testing uh, is not that you're going to have a whole a bunch of different uh, treatments that you offer. Rachel just talked through in excellent detail the pharmacotherapies that are available, uh, most of which uh, are on a research scope. But the reason for testing often is to try to prevent transmission of the virus to other people, to try to come up with ways to protect ourselves and to protect those who will enter the physical spaces where patients have been otherwise. This uh, slide is, as uh, all good talks, is stolen straight away from Stephen Liang. I, I don't know where he got it, but I really like the depiction. And I think it does a great job of showing droplets uh, falling out of the air immediately from someone who's coughing and then aerosol particles that uh, stay in the air. The duration of time that those things are present on the physical surfaces where they land or in the air around the person who coughed them out is variable and depends on a few factors. Uh, Dave Warren tells me that humidity and heat are really important factors in how long these particles live, or not live, but sustain. Uh, and also the type of surface where they land is, uh, is going to be really important. So cardboard, for example, may not last as long as stainless steel, and, and I don't remember the differential times for that. But the important uh, recognition here is that fomites are real and proper cleaning and uh, pr protection uh, provided via uh, things like not opening doorknobs with your hands is going to be is going to be really important because you don't know when a fomite landed on that surface last. The other thing that, that is uh, of course important is personal protective equipment. Uh, the 
approach to the COVID patient would not be complete without a thorough discussion of what to do with this. I'll tell you the current recommendations from DJC, and then I'll acknowledge that these may change at any minute, and I will find out at the same time and you do probably, and then I'm happy to read the thing and answer questions uh, as they come. Um, in patients who are not having aerosol generating procedures, and we're gonna talk some about what those are, we recommend a face mask, eye protection, gown, and gloves, and that's really sufficient. That is not a recommendation that is made because of supply chain issues. That's a recommendation made because we actually believe that that's sufficient. The supply chain issues are there, so we don't wanna waste N95s if we don't need them, but we especially don't wanna put healthcare workers in harm's way by making recommendations that are insufficient to protect them. So I fully believe that the guidance to shift to face masks is based in the best interest of the patient, the provider, and the whole system. And, and I think that it's safe to do that. For patients who are having an aerosol generating procedure, and, and those include bronchoscopy and intubation and uh, a few other things that we'll look at, the recommendation is for an N95 respirator, a gown, goggles, and gloves. In terms of N95 fit testing, this is a very hot topic, uh, exceedingly hot topic, but uh, it's important to recognize that the fit testing that is done with the sprays is useful, but it's not necessarily mandatory. And in fact, uh, we're not in a position where we can fit test everyone who hasn't yet been fit tested. So recommendation from the system is if you've passed a, a fit test on a mask, you should use that mask. Uh, that size of mask is, is right for you and it should be the same. If you haven't taken a fit test, one approach could be to put on the mask that is appropriate for your sort of build and uh, take, you know, make a seal with it and then take some quick breaths in and out and see if the mask flexes in and out. And if it does, you have a sufficient seal that uh, most environmental safety people, I, I think all environmental safety people in our system feel like that's providing you adequate protection. So we recommend making sure that wherever you are, if you are in interfacing with patients who are known to have or suspected to have COVID that you use your best judgment to uh, put on the personal protective equipment that's gonna keep you safe. Um, it's important also to mention that the N95 reuse policy is based in what we think will work as well as what we think conserves our resources. So if you have an N95 and you're wearing it, uh, don't uh, engage in the age old behavior of dumping the box on the ground and throwing them all away uh, that you dropped. You use your mask, keep it safe and wear it uh, until it no longer creates the seal that I talked about just a second ago. Another important part of the strategy for dealing with COVID patients, at least in our context, is uh, cohorting. So we've made the strategic decision to cohort patients who are persons under investigation or confirmed to have COVID into particular geographic areas within the hospital. That decision is really intentional and a lot of thought has gone behind where exactly to put them. And so uh, we recommend that we continue that practice. Obviously, there are enough PUIs based on the liberalization of testing that we can't take every person who we think might have it and put them into a cohorted space that would be a logistical impossibility in addition to exposing some people who don't have it to an environment what, what may be higher risk. So uh, our recommendation remains to cohort and uh, I'm happy to answer questions at the end about how those decisions have been made for where the units could be. We'll talk some about that in an upcoming slide. In the course of coming up with stuff to show in this talk, I think one of the most important things is to think about how the aerosol is structured and how different procedures generate aerosol. I really am a fan of these models, which are uh, essentially just mannequins that have pulsed um, radioactive or, or nuclear tracer, I mean gas, and then they, they take a camera and shoot across the mannequin and see what generates out of the mannequin with different uh, maneuvers. And so in this particular series of pictures, what we're looking at is a mannequin that's being simulated to cough. You can see on the, uh, I guess the far side of the screen, you can see a giant green cloud that's a normal cough effort. So they essentially estimated the amount of flow with a normal cough, and then they flowed the gas through the mannequin in a pulse fashion at that cadence. And you can see the amount of aerosol that's generated and the uh, space around the face where that aerosol is. That's gonna immediately droplet out and stuff around that is going to have fomites now. And then you can see the little cloud that extends even farther. That cloud is gonna be what's in the air and may stick around for a while. So. On the closer side, you can see there's a rough outline of what appears to be a person near the coughing uh, cloud. That is what the impact of oral suctioning can have on preventing the aerosolization so that you get some of the particulate matter that had hung out in what is an uh, approximated oral, oropharynx. Getting rid of that prevents as much of the aerosolization. And so really uh, getting back to the cohorting idea, part of what we wanna do is make sure that we're keeping people in a controlled way where we can clean the room appropriately and prevent anybody from accidentally coming into a space that, that has that uh, circumstance. Again, personal protective equipment is sufficient and, and uh, should be more than enough to protect you from uh, encountering
encountering this type of thing, but, but it's worth recognizing what exactly we're talking about. I never in my life thought I would understand anything about HVAC systems. And over the last couple of weeks, I've spent a lot of time with our excellent team uh, led by Jesse Revelo, who think about how to handle our facilities. Uh, a lot of the work that we've done is to try to do what we can to maintain pressurization rate gradients that make sense. It is no longer mandatory. It never really has been mandatory that people with this uh, condition be maintained in a, in a negative pressure room. We know there's not enough stock for that. Uh, and we also know that um, it's not really even necessary from a safety standpoint as long as other precautions are taken. That said, we certainly don't want a positive pressure situation where someone's in a room that is blowing air out of the room containing this aerosolization uh, that we talked about. So, for example, many of the rooms in Parkview Tower have positive pressure at the baseline, and so you would not want somebody sitting in a positive pressure room coughing, generating this aerosol, and then having that aerosolized uh, viral particulate matter blown into the hallway and blown to other uh, floors. There's also a, a really important thing that happens uh, in air handlers where air from different floors mixes. And so when that mixing occurs, the air uh, contains whatever aerosol particles and then is sent to the other floors in the building uh, and could be a problem if, if not carefully attended to. I don't bring this up to be terrifying. Uh, I bring it up because I think it's really important to understand when you think about the cohorting strategy and you think about what we've done to approach how we care for these patients as a system, a lot of it has been taking considerations like this in mind and doing what we can to, to protect everybody by optimizing those situations. Moving into how you handle the clinical situation in front of you if you're taking care of somebody who has COVID, I think that the single most important thing to say is people who can stay home should stay home. Now, if people don't need to come to the hospital, they don't need to come to the hospital. They, they don't need that level of care and uh, having them in the environment is a risk to them. And, uh, general, generally does not uh, add any value for them. And, and so we would recommend that we advise patients who aren't really sick to, to just stay home. Most of the care, as Rachel said, is supportive. And so most of what we're going to do is symptom management or uh, managing the complications that come. And we'll talk some about that. But it's, it's, it is worth recognizing that if somebody's getting uh, short of breath quickly or they're hypoxemic, this can worsen with a pretty quick uh, clip. And so you don't want to send somebody home who's desatting significantly or who's feeling short of breath. Where, where we may be thinking about some home oxygen strategies, we want to be really cautious about um, not sending somebody who's got a uh, time horizon that's quick in terms of how, how they're worsening. Uh, uh, most intensivists who talk about this really like to talk a lot about trajectory and the notion that you need to see where this patient was a few minutes ago, where they are now, as you make a decision about what to do. If they do worsen to the point that you think you need to put them on uh, ventilatory support, it's worth uh, keeping in mind that things like bagging do generate aerosol. I obviously got really excited about these mannequin depictions. And so uh, this is another one of them. You can see three different bags. Uh, bag number C or bag letter C has a filter on it. And so you can see and, and the slides, uh, you can sort of zoom in on your own and get a really good sense of where the aerosol is coming from. But we're recommending against using bag mass ventilation in this population of patients because of the substantial increase in aerosolization that uh, transpires when it's happening. Respiratory therapies broadly have similar impacts. You can see at the top of the screen that if you put somebody on BiPAP, you've got a radius of aerosolization that's approximately half a meter. If you put somebody on high settings with the BiPAP, you can see it gets up to a meter. And so we're also recommending against high flow oxygen and positive pressure ventilation that's not through a sealed circuit uh, in, in this population. That's not to say that if somebody were going to die without this therapy that we would withhold it. That's to say that we're going to try to choose alternative therapies and in patients for whom respiratory failure is, is happening and they're rapidly worsening, we're not going to try to stave them over with BiPAP, uh, recognizing that they often worsen and it doesn't help that much in that situation and so we move right to intubation. In terms of how to do that, uh, this is a sequence from Life in the Fast Lane, which is a popular emergency medicine um, website showing the way to do rapid sequence innovation. And every intensivist should be familiar with this. And it basically involves uh, doing your best to try to uh, give someone all the medicines they need right at once and then get them intubated safely so that you minimize aerosolization and minimize risk for aspiration and so on. So this is what we've recommended to be used in anybody who needs, uh, needs to be intubated. Once they're intubated, Proper management really overlaps substantially with what proper critical care looks like. Manage the ventilator in a way that's appropriate for the patient and the situation they're in. Target fluid management in a way that doesn't uh, sort of do it blindly, but tries to use some decision-making rubric to help uh, make our best guess about how to control people's uh, volume status, uh, practicing good antibiotic stewardship, and then doing supportive care like we talked about. I'll quickly say that uh, this this is one of my pet issues. There is no right amount of PEEP. You'll hear a lot of chatter in, in the critical 
care space about, oh, these are very peak responsive or very not peak responsive, and people talk about microatelectasis and all this that they think may be more prevalent in this disease state, and I think that's fair to talk about and, and interesting to think about, but uh, in every ventilated patient, it's my perspective that trying to understand the physiology is going to help you uh, apply the evidence in a more rational way, uh, and so I recommend you know, taking the same stock of what's happening when you turn up the PEEP as we usually would is, is the right response. So turn up the PEEP and see if the plateau pressure goes up or down and how you're doing in terms of recruitment. And when you do that, you'll get someone set up, I think, for a better likelihood of success. Everyone wants to ask about ECMO. Our center will continue to support ECMO patients. We, we are already doing that. Uh, COVID does not change our decision-making rubric for ECMO patients at all. We're uh, interested in providing the right support for patients who need it. At this point, there, there's no uh, resource constraint on the immediate horizon. And so we're uh, supporting patients the way we always have. We uh, are probably being a little bit more cautious in some of the um, clearly more abundant patients for whom the therapy is unlikely to be helpful, but uh, generally we're, we're not using COVID as an exclusion uh, for support. This, what I have on the screen now, is a depiction from the European uh, Extracorporeal Life Support Organization that shows all of the countries in Europe that have supported patients with ECMO and how many people they've supported. Uh, it does not show outcomes, and I think we're still too early to have a good sense of what the outcome data will be. But again, we're not uh, using that as an exclusion criteria. I won't touch really at all on pharmacotherapy because I think Rachel did a great job, but I do want to point out that this treatment guidance was issued by the system, and similar treatment guidance will continue to be issued as the situation evolves. At the same time, we're um, working with different task forces from around the WashU School of Medicine and around the community hospitals as well to come up with the right ways to approach different situations. The critical care task force has reached, uh, has uh, decided on several uh, sort of guidance documents that can be reviewed and seen and, and thought about. They're not policies, but they're ways to have expert opinions uh, at your fingertips if you're taking care of these patients. Last slide here uh, for me is the recognition that while I said we're not yet in a crisis mode and we're not in a severe resource limitation mode, we are uh, facing one. This is a contingency mode where we're doing things we don't normally do. We've moved people out of ICU physical plant and into other spaces around the, around the system to provide care. And so we, we really want to recognize that it's going to be important to make decisions in a way that's responsible over the weeks ahead. Jay Malone is a friend of mine and a pediatric intensivist who's a professional ethicist as well. And he's really uh, joined the team uh, from around the School of Medicine and around the system to try to help develop heuristics that we can use to make tough decisions that range from who gets this antibiotic or who gets this ventilator when we're in a situation where we don't have enough of all of that to go around. Those are tough questions and, and they're not easy to answer, but I'm thankful for his work and for the work of, of those in the system who are trying to prepare us for how to do that in a way that's respectful of persons across demographics and is uh, as, as fair and just as it, as it can be. I'll show the QR code and then the last thing I'll say, uh, I don't have a, a thank you slide and the reason is that there are just far too many people. Uh, there are far too many people who are do, doing so much to help prepare our system and our hospital um, for the response to this pandemic and I, I've been truly amazed by the work of, of a lot of different uh, people and I specifically want to call out the frontline people um, such as those in environmental safety, those in security, those who are patient care technicians who are really front and center, right at the bedside or right in the room or right in harm's way and who often uh, don't get the time in their schedule to attend the Grand Rounds and hear a bunch of information about how to uh, kind of feel reassured. So uh, I, I think the groups of people in the lab and the groups of people at the system and the groups of physicians and nurses are all, all worthy of, of great thanks. And, and I specifically think that uh, those people who bravely show up for work when they don't know what they're up against are people that we owe a debt of gratitude that uh, we won't ever be able to repay. But um, with that, I thank you for the time and uh, we'll take some questions. So, uh, we have time for a, a couple questions. Uh, Dr. Lick, can you prioritize some of the top or most common questions so we can farm those out to Dr. Diamond, Dr. Presti, and Dr. Aguilar? Okay, so in the interest of time, we're just going to pick a couple of the top questions here. I think uh, one of the first ones that came was for Dr. Diamond, and the question uh, being um, that it seems that we could learn from the historical lessons to help today. Um, question being, what are the reasons that the SARS version 1 disappeared from human disease that you had mentioned in your initial slides? Yeah, so... Um SARS-1, if you will, the original SARS and SARS-2 have some differences which probably impact why 
we saw an epidemic with one and a pandemic with the other. And it really probably has to do with the nature of transmission and the amount of infectious dose that's required and who is transmitting. In the original SARS, mo the vast majority of the transmission was being done by symptomatic people. And whereas it is emerging from data in Iceland and other places that there is a significant transmission by asymptomatic people. And so if you think about that from a public health standpoint, that's a problem because the reason why SARS was controlled was because we could identify the people who were sick and then using what I'll call 19th century public health, we were able to isolate them quickly and then uh, impose strict uh, uh, quarantine measures and then disrupt the transmission cycle. However, there was not a huge amount or even small amount of transmission in asymptomatics in the original SARS. Whereas in this case, if, if it is true, which it seems to be that asymptomatics can transmit then you need global social distancing to stop this because you can't identify the people who look well who are actually contributing to, tran to transmission. And so I think that's one of the major differences and maybe why the original SARS uh, was readily controlled, whereas this one is much more difficult. And then the other issue, which we don't know yet, is what is the minimal infection dose required to transmit? And those studies are underway. Clearly, we have now seen that SARS-2 can last for days, two to three days on surfaces, metal, plastic, or otherwise, and even on cardboard for 24 hours. We talked about door handles beyond the respiratory droplets. It's the, it's the other sources which may be able to contribute to this. So like, this makes it a much more challenging thing. So we have learned lessons, but the problem is, is that we're dealing with some element of this that is distinct. And that's why I think we've shifted from an epidemic to a pandemic. Okay, next question, I think, uh, for Dr. Presti here. Um, question being, is there any observational data on the incidence severity of COVID-19 in patients who've been taking hydroxychloroquine at baseline, for example, in SLE or RA patients? Does that make sense? That's easy. I am not aware of, sorry, I am not aware of data um, in um, that patient population. Um, but I think the expectation was that there may be some protection um, to people who were on hydroxychloroquine. There are ongoing studies um, using hydroxychloroquine as a pre-exposure prophylaxis um, that are, that are um, we don't have data yet, but, but I think that would be a, a very similar kind of population. Okay. And a follow-up question for you real quick. Uh, is there any role for zinc in the treatment of these patients? Um, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Um, I think zinc has been used for a long time in the treatment of common colds and coronaviruses do cause common colds. Um, the, the one thing to keep in mind is, is um, the, you know, there are toxicities with overdose of, of um, natural sort of uh, remedies. Um, and the, the prior use of, of intranasal zinc did result in a considerable amount of um, loss of smell. So um, I, think, uh, I think we just don't know, um, but a multivitamin is probably not a terrible idea. Okay, question for Dr. Aguilar is, uh, since respiratory failure can develop quickly, how do we decide which patients are safe to keep at home? Uh, that's a fantastic question. I think uh, if, the, if you learn one thing in a critical care fellowship, and I referred to this a second ago, it's that trajectory is everything. Uh, and I think that the thing that I would use in my mind to decide who to send home is what's the time course of how they're worsening. If somebody was totally fine yesterday and now is super short of breath and you know the SATs are kind of low 90s, I, I would be inclined to watch that person. I think that person's at high risk. Uh, if there's somebody who's had a cough and fever for a couple days and they're not feeling great, but they're not uh, not super short of breath and their oxygen's holding on, I, I'm not as inclined to admit that person. So I think that the main name of the game there is just just watching how they progress. And watching with BJC or setting up telehealth and home care for patients with COVID at home to monitor them for symptoms to help evaluate who needs to come back and when they need to come back. So that works in progress. Adam, one more question, then we're done. 
Yes, I think we'll end with a question for uh, Dr. Diamond, um, and that's that the SARS-CoV, and it seems SARS-CoV-2, uh, seem to use RNA methyl transferases to cap and methylate their genomic and subgenomic RNA transcripts and protect and proofread. Has anyone investigated nucleoside analog hypomethylating agents at an attenuated dose uh, to inhibit these methyl transferases and inhibit the RNA polymerase? So not for SARS-CoV-2, but it has been looked at coronaviruses in general. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of work on methyltransferase inhibitors. There's multiple methyltransferase steps in the coronavirus genome. The problem with these drugs is they have off-target effects. Uh, so the methyltransferase active site, as you might imagine, is relatively conserved. And so even though there are some subtle differences associated with the viral methyltransferase, there in historically, Novartis had a very large program to study methyltransferase as drug inhibitors for multiple viruses. And it never went anywhere because of two reasons. One is, is they were always having host target effects, meaning they were inhibiting the host. And so oftentimes what you find is that these drugs, while they may have activity against the virus, they often have activity against um, the immune response, which is proliferating. And so the combination of is some mild immunosuppression outweighs the effects that you see um, with uh, uh, methyltransferase inhibition of the virus. And so they have not really progressed particularly far because of these, uh, the inability to distinguish the virus and the host methyltransferase. Okay, I think we're gonna have to stop there, but what we'll do is take all the other questions that were sent in by chat to get the experts to answer those questions and then we'll send them back out and then this Grand Rounds will be posted online so others can watch. I know we had a uh, max capacity of 300 on this particular call, but we'll get it out so more people can view it again. So you can't hear a lot of clapping, but I know all 300 people are clapping very loudly for our outstanding speakers today. So Dr. Diamond, Presti, and Aguilar, thank you very much for everything you're doing and really terrific talks. Awesome, you guys. <laughs>